How many of you are tired of opening your social media apps to fiery conflicts over politics? It's a familiar feeling, right? Political polarization is destroying our capacity for civil discourse, and the rise of social media is amplifying the problem. Countless studies have documented the rise of political polarization, and this is not just the ideological disagreements that, char that are characteristic of democracy. This is effective polarization, which researchers at NYU define as a form of partisan hostility characterized by seeing one's opponents not only as wrong on important issues, but also abhorrent, unpatriotic, and a danger to the country's future. This has significant consequences for democracy, as if we have these feelings about each other, we can no longer participate in civil discourse that's essential to our political function. It also, it also contributes to gridlock between our elected officials, as they can neither uh, participate in such civil discourse. And tragically, this has also led to political violence, like the incident on January 6th. Social media has become a facet of our political society. Over 70% of American adults consumed news on social media in 2019. In light of this, I conducted research into the role of social media in rising political polarization. This led me to the conclusion that through its features and the environment it creates, social media exacer exacerbates polarization and its damaging effects. I developed research aimed at, raise, aimed at raising awareness of social media's polarizing effects and providing solutions to this issue. In my research paper, I targeted those who, are, um, those who use social media for their primary source of news and political information uh, so that they can be more aware of problems that this, these platforms are uh, creating and then participate more effectively in our political society. Now I'll turn to discuss some of my findings, beginning with the evidence of social media's role in intensifying political, political polarization. It's important to understand that polarization has existed long before social media, and social media is not the sole agitator of this issue. But it has been demonstrated that social media intensifies political polarization in a number of important ways. This has been shown by um, scholarly research from over a dozen studies that condemn social media's role in political polarization. I won't go into each of those, uh, they're in my paper. But um, there's also evidence from within social media companies themselves. Now, these companies conduct significant research in, into their societal, into the societal effects of their platforms. And one of these studies leaked from Facebook to the Wall Street Journal. The researchers for Facebook found that our algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness. If left unchecked, Facebook would feed users more and more divisive content in an effort to gain user attention and increase time on the platform. In response to this study and the findings of the researchers, Facebook scrapped the study didn't address the, the problem at all. It's clear that there's an issue with these social media companies and their contribution to political polarization, and it's time for change. So it's important to understand how social media polarizes us so that we can be aware of these effects and develop informed solutions. Through my research, I found two different ways, two distinct ways in which social media contributes to political polarization. One of these is personalization algorithms. So the algorithm, algorithms control what you see and when you see it on social media. Now they contribute to political polarization by amplifying biased news coverage over that from neutral sources, incentivizing negative and extreme content from users and sources, and promoting outgroup animosity that disparages those who are different from you politically. They also contribute to the development of partisan echo chambers. So echo chambers describe the politically homogenous groups social media users are confined to. So by their nature, social media pulls people into groups of consistent ideological positions. Uh, this, this is done through the polarizing exposure to pro-attitudinal sources, so you don't have access to information that challenges your beliefs and makes you think differently about a topic. It also divides users of differing perspectives, making it difficult for them to, to understand each other and sympathize with each other's positions and communicate effectively about uh, their different ideas. It also creates false perceptions of reality. This can be seen in uh, members of society and different political parties having completely different understandings of the issues before our country and how they think about them and the ways they think about them. So like an example of this is like, if you think about COVID-19 or the, the COVID-19 vaccine or the pandemic and just how completely different either, either political party thinks about that issue. They can't even reach the same uh, basic facts. In light of social media's polarizing effects on our society, I hope to provide some comprehensive solutions to the problems we face. I utilize my research to formulate, formulate solutions that can be implemented at the corporate, government, and individual levels. The threat of polarization
polarization is great. We must take action to repair our democracy now. So some of the corporate solutions that social media companies can implement, they can make existing polarization tools permanent. They can adjust algorithms to recommend more diverse content. They can increase their transparency, and they can also develop some new features to try to address some of their effects. Social media companies already have the tools to adjust their algorithms in time for the political unrest. They've done it uh, in the 2020 election and a number of other emergency situations, but for some reason, they don't implement these tools permanently. Uh, in terms of adjusting algorithms, there's a study conducted by the American Economic Review that found that uh, exposing users to one to four counter attitudinal sources, so sources that present a different idea than what they would traditionally think, had the same depolarizing effects as logging out of social media for two months. Literally adjusting these algorithms and rec recommending some more diverse content can make some serious impacts on political polarization. They could also be more transparent about how they make these changes in order to avoid political backlash, and they could share some data with researchers to uh, help us better understand the effects of political polarization. In terms of new features, they could create dichotomous news posts, which would essentially show you two different two different stories of the same issue. So um, maybe you would see in the same post a post from CNN and a post from Fox about the same issue, so that you get a uh, holistic understanding of what's being covered. They could also label media sources with bias ratings so people are aware of the bias that's being presented to them and seek out uh, sources different from what they would traditionally encounter. Some of the government solutions I had, um, our government has not kept up with social media's rise to prominence in, from a policy perspective. Uh, given the financial incentives to maintain the status quo for these companies, government must step in. We have no comprehensive social media legislation despite its rising prominence in our political society. There's also limited oversight of these uh, companies. The FTC should work with stakeholders to develop enforceable regulations that can ensure that we can limit the polarizing effects of these platforms. We can also fund better research to understand this issue, and we can implement some local solutions. Local government has the most concrete, concrete impact on its citizens, and they can provide social media training classes so that people can have a better understanding of how to participate in social media effectively. <coughs> and they could also, states could also work to include social media training and civics curriculum in order to uh, help our youth have a better understanding of how to communicate effectively and share their ideas in a healthy way. There's also, in, there's also solutions that we can implement for ourselves. We can seek out different sources for ourselves. We can help to escape the polarizing effects of social media setting of social media algorithms. We can adjust our privacy settings to limit the the data that algorithms have access to, and we can serve as an example of uh, sorry, we can serve as an example of civil discourse. We need to act. We need to carry ourselves with tolerance and listen to listen to understand. We can't allow uh, hyper-partisan arguments to continue to dominate social media sites. We have to speak up. We have to use our voice to promote civil discourse. And lastly, we need to advocate for change. Our democracy is built upon the will of the people, and we must use our voice to advocate for change at the government and corporate levels. So reflecting on this project, uh, over the course of this project, I learned a lot about the role of communication in our society and about our own role in democracy in our political government. Um, for one, I learned about the significance of communication and democracy. Communication is essential to just our exchange of ideas, our ability to govern ourselves. And civil discourse is essential to that um, ability. We have to be able to communicate effectively, and share our ideas in a way that's respectful of others and um, collaborates towards policy solutions. I've also learned that more communication is not always better. Social media encourages or enables significant communication. You can reach anyone on the globe. You can share your voice, uh, amplify your voice several times over. But it's about the healthy communication and the healthy exchange of ideas that is, in, that is important for our democracy. I also learned about our own, uh, our duty to democracy. We have to take an active role in protecting our democracy. We cannot allow ourselves to be passive and uninformed citizens. I also was reminded that everyone can make a difference. We all have a voice and the ability to incite change. 
We have to use this voice for the sake of our democracy and for, this, for the health of our society. Despite its ills, social media gives us a microphone to incite solutions. And it's important that we recognize the perils of this tool, but also the virtues of it and use that effectively. So why does this project matter? At its center, democracy requires collaboration. As our nation faces increasingly complex issues, we cannot allow social media to sow division among us. It is my hope that this project raises awareness of social media polarization and inspires the change we need to repair our democracy. Thank you.